peoples. Nice to see you. Uh, I'm going to do a talk today on the, um, the Great Master's letter, or the March Owens letter. And I'm going to do quite a, one or two talks over the next few days, probably on, on Theosophy and Buddhism. Uh, that's why I've got the, the Buddhas with me today. Um, I've already lit the candles of harmony, as you can see, so keep that harmony within your hearts as, a, as the day goes on. There's my water. And I um, <coughs> hope you enjoy this talk. Let's have a little, a minute, a little, just a minute of quiet, just breathe out any tension. And just, let's get our minds ready to absorb the words. I've told you before about tuning the breath and the mind. Keeping the breath quiet, silent, and the mind relaxed. Tune the mind and the breath so the, the mind is tranquil. The breath is silent and rhythmic. Just breathe out any tension and relax. This is a great master's letter. <clears throat> Several years before the Theosophical Society was founded, Sri Ramalingam Swami in South India started a society based on brotherhood and due to lack of interest, he closed it and made a statement that rishis living beyond the Himalayas will be sending people from Russia and America. He was very specific about these two countries. When they come and preach brotherhood, you all will listen, he said. So the plan for the launching of the Theosophical Society was hinted at about 10 years before the Theosophical Society came into existence. The seeds were sown. It seems obvious that many individuals and groups throughout the world were aware of its uh, arrival beforehand. Now Ramalingam was a Tamil saint and poet of the 19th century. He raised the flag of brotherhood on his one room residence on October the 22nd, 1873. He gave his last and most famous lecture, entreating his audience to undertake a spiritual quest and look into the nature of the powers that lie beyond us and move us, and asking them to meditate on the lighted lamp from his room which he placed outside. On January the 30th, 1874, he, he entered his room and locked himself in and told his followers not to open it. He said that even if they did open it, they would find nothing. His seclusion started many rumours and the government finally forced the doors open in May. The room was empty with no clues as to his whereabouts. The Madras District Gazetteer, published by the South Arcot District in 1906, records his disappearance. So what happened to him, and whether he, ha he had any input in the Theosophical Society, is open to speculation. It seems almost certain that he did. Now, the history behind the Marchion's letter is as follows. After the correspondence between A.P. Sinnott and A.O. Hume, with Master K.H. started. One of the frequent suggestions of Synod was that demonstration of psychic powers by indisputable phenomena would attract the public. Master K.H. repeatedly told Synod that brotherhood <coughs> is the objective of the Theosophical Society and not at all phenomena <coughs> and psychic matters. Finally, Master K.H. took one of Synod's letters to the Mahachuan who is said to be his boss. 
and the letter I'm talking about today was a summary of the discussion between the Maha Chuan and Master KH. HPB considered the letter to be the charter for the Theosophical Society, the TS, as I will call it. Though the original letter is nowhere to be found. HPB herself from time to time had quoted it extensively, extensively from it, have had, have had others since. The term Mahachuan refers to the great Chohan or great master and the Theosophical Glossary defines him as the chief of a spiritual hierarchy or of a school of occultism, the head of the trans Himalayan mystics. The original message was delivered around 1880 but despite there being no trace of the actual letter HPB made use of portions of it in the magazine's Lucifer, the magazine Lucifer in August 1888 and it has been reprinted in various publications since. The Master Moria added a comment to the letter that it was an abridged version of the views of the Chohan from his own words given last night. Alice Leighton Cleaver adds in her book H.P. Blavatsky, Her Life and Work for Humanity that her copy had the heading Several Good Reasons Given by the Chohan Why the, the TS Should Be a Brotherhood of Humanity for the similar eclectic TS. The Master K.H. had stated in one of his letters that the Chiefs want a Brotherhood of Humanity, a real universal fraternity started. Now the similar eclectic were the, was the brainchild of A. Ho Hume and A. P. Sinnott, mainly, and they were interested in finding out about the phenomena that HPB and others produced, and not at all interested in the brotherhood aspect. One of the main points emphasised in the letter is the importance of the Buddha in the hierarchy, which has been somewhat obscured in recent times. In a letter to A. P. Sinnott, H. P. B. stated that Gautama Buddha was the fourth Buddha of the fourth round and the fifth teacher, as the first was a Jian Chuan or Jiani Buddha, known popularly as Amitabha, who had brought over the spiritual seed from the previous round to plant it in this one. Gautama Buddha came at the closing of the fourth race between the fourth and fifth. The next to come will be at the close of the fifth race in several thousand years and he will be Maitreya Buddha but it will be too complex to go into all of this in too much detail but hopefully it will illustrate the importance of the Buddha but it is interesting as many individuals and organisations are saying that the time for the coming of Maitreya is at hand but esoteric Buddhism places his arrival several thousands of years in the future, as does the Theosophical teaching. <coughs> so let's look at some of the main points in, in this letter. In the beginning, <coughs> the Mahatyawan says, for our doctrines to pr practically react on the so-called moral code or the ideas of truthfulness, purity, self-denial, denial, charity, etc., we have to preach and popularise a knowledge of theosophy. <coughs> it is not the individual and determined purpose of attaining oneself nirvana, the culmination of all knowledge and absolute wisdom, which is, after all, only an exalted and glorious selfishness, but the self-sacrificing pursuit of the best means to lead on the right path our neighbour, to cause as many of our fellow creatures as we possibly can to benefit by it, which constitutes the true theosophist. So here he is emphasising that our studies and meditations should not be aimed at gaining knowledge for our own entertainment, but to be of benefit to others. To reach nirvana, or don the dharmakaya robe, as the Buddhists say, is oblivion of man and the world forever or at least until the next Manvantara, when the effects of the selfishness will be experienced in a, in a lower level of human rebirth. HPB remarks in a footnote in the voice of the silence that Pratyeka Buddhas are those bodhisattvas 
who strive after and often reach the Dharmakaya robe after a series of lives, caring nothing for the woes of mankind or to help it, but only for their own bliss, they enter nirvana and disappear from the sight and hearts of men. In Northern Buddhism, a Pratyeka Buddha is a synonym of spiritual selfishness. And in the Theosophical Glossary it states, the Pratyeka Buddha is the same as Pasi Buddha. The Pratyeka Buddha is a degree which belongs exclusively to the Yogacharya school. Yet it is only one of high intellectual development with no true spirituality. It is the dead letter of the yoga laws in which intellect and comprehension play the greatest part, added to the strict carrying out of the rules of the inner development. It is one of the three paths to nirvana and the lowest in which a yogi, without teacher and without saving others, by the mere force of will and technical observances, attains to a kind of nominal Buddhaship individually, doing no good to anyone, but working selfishly for his own salvation and himself alone. So, so despite some people in the West disputing this idea, I have read through many Buddhist sutras and texts that support this teaching and corroborate what HPB said on the subject in many places. The Mahachuan goes on to say, the intellectual portions of mankind seem to be fast dividing into two classes, the one unconsciously preparing for itself long periods of temporary annihilation or states of non-consciousness owing to its deliberate surrender of their intellect, its imprisonment in the narrow grooves of bigotry and superstition, which is a process which cannot fail to lead to the utter deformation of the intellectual principle, the other unrestrainingly indulging its animal propensities with the deliberate intention of submitting to annihilation, pure and simple, in, in cases of failure, to millenniums of degradation after physical dissolution. We can clearly see in the modern world how the, inter how the intellectual classes in politics, the arts, the media and the religion etc. are morally ruining those they ought to be guiding and protecting. This is because the spiritual dimension in generally is generally left out as the world goes deeper into the age of Kali and spiritual darkness. Fortunately a few, a few are keeping the flame alive which is invaluable. That's why the Theosophical Society and other organiz similar organisations are, so are still so important, as long as they keep to these lines, of course. So I'll leave you to ponder this. Then he says that it is time that Theosophy should enter the arena. And he goes on to say, The Theosophical Society was chosen as the cornerstone, the foundation of the future religions of humanity. To achieve the proposed object, a greater, wiser and especially a more benevolent intermingling of the high and the low of the Alpha and the Omega of society was determined upon. The white race must be the first to stretch out the hand of fellowship to the dark nations to call the poor despised nigger brother. Of course he puts nigger in um, speech marks because it's said in a kind of um, critical way. This prospect may not smile to all. He is no theosophist who objects to this principle. So, of course, at the time, the level of racial abuse and intolerance was a lot higher than it even is now. But it still exists, of course. But even many English members of the Theosophical Society at the time found it difficult to regard the Indian members as their equals, as there was this inbred feeling of British superiority. The Mahachoan then gives this teaching. In view of the ever increasing triumph and, and at the same time misuse of free thought and liberty, the universal reign of Satan, Eliphas Levi, would have called it, how is the combative natural instinct of man to be restrained from inflicting hitherto unheard of cruelties and tyrannies, injustice, etc.? 
if not through the soothing influence of brotherhood and of the practical application of Buddha's esoteric doctrines. For as everyone knows, total emancipation from authority of the one all-pervading power or law, called God by the theists, Buddha, divine wisdom and enlightenment or theosophy by the philosophers of all ages, means also the emancipation from that of human law. Once unfettered and delivered from the dead weight of dogmatic interpretations, personal names, anthropomorphic conceptions and salaried priests, the fundamental doctrines of all religions will be proved identical in their esoteric meaning. Osiris, Krishna, Buddha, Christ will be shown as different means for one and the same royal highway to final bliss, nirvana. Mystical Christ Christianity, that is to say, that Christianity which teaches self-redemption through one's own seventh principle, the liberated Parahatma, called by the one Christ, by others Buddha, and equivalent to regeneration or rebirth in spirit, will be found just the same truth as the nirvana of mystical Buddhism. All of us have to get rid of our own ego, the illusory apparent self, to recognise our true self in a transcendental divine life. But if we would not be selfish, we must strive to make other people see that truth, to recognise the reality of that transcendental self, the Buddha, the Christ, or God, of every preacher. This is why even exoteric Buddhism is the surest path to lead men toward the one esoteric truth. So we must, so we must um, not just recognise the divine in ourselves, but help others to see it too. This is the real purpose of the Theosophical Society. Once again, he emphasises the keynote of compassion, inspired by the life and teachings of Gautama Buddha. Compassion should always be unconditional. We should not pick and choose who to show compassion to. Those who we may feel revulsion towards will need the most compassion and love. If we send them thoughts of anger or hatred, we increase the anger and, anger and hatred in them and in the world in general. As Jesus said, love your enemies, bless those that curse you, and pray for those that despitefully use you. And the Buddha said, hatred never overcomes hatred, only love overcomes hatred. This is the eternal law. To overcome hatred and revulsion to individuals and groups of people is also a great test for us and a barrier we have to overcome. I like the expression to recognise our true self in a transcendental divine life. A Zen teacher said that recognising this true self is like meeting your own father on the road. This is because it is so natural. The Zen teachers also say, why look elsewhere for your own feet? We call this true self the original face. Then the master states the theosophical intent even more strongly. Shall we devote ourselves to teaching a few Europeans fed on the fat of the land, many of them loaded with the gifts of blind fortune, the rationale of bell ringing, cup growing, of the spiritual telephone and astral body formation, and leave the teeming millions of the ignorant, of the poor and despised, the lowly and the oppressed, to take care of themselves and of their own hereafter, <coughs> the best they can, the best they know how? Never. Rather perish the Theosophical Society with both its hapless founders, and that we shall permit it to become no better than an academy of magic and a hall of occultism. That we, the devoted followers of that spirit incarnate of absolute self-sacrifice, of philanthropy, divine kindness, as of all the highest virtu virtues attainable on this earth of sorrow, the man of men, Gautama Buddha, should ever allow the Theosophical Society to represent the embodiment of selfishness, the refuge of the few, with no thought in them for the many, is a strange idea, my brothers. So the Mahachoans here taking Sinat and Hume to task 
for wanting such an academy of magic and hall of occultism, again emphasising the importance of the Buddha in all this. HPB had often warned about the consequence of not putting this essential teaching of brotherhood into practice. In the article Our Cycle and the Next, she states, If theosophy prevailing in the struggle, its all-embracing philosophy strikes deep root into the minds and hearts of men, if its doctrines of reincarnation and karma, in other words of hope and responsibility, find hope in the lives of the new generations, that indeed will dawn the day of joy and gladness for all who now suffer and are outcast. For real theosophy is altruism, and we cannot repeat it too often. It is brotherly love, mutual help, unswerving devotion to truth. If once men do but realise that in these alone can true happiness be found, and never in wealth, possessions or any selfish gratification, then the dark clouds will roll away and a new humanity will be born upon earth. Then the golden age will be there indeed. But then she says, but if not, then the storm will burst, and our beloved Western, our boasted Western civilization and enlightenment will sink in such a sea of horror that its parallel history has never yet recorded. Since this was published in 1889, we've had two world wars, as well as countless other conflicts, terrorism, etc. Because the theosophical teaching of universal brotherhood was not taken seriously enough, mainly by members of the Theosophical Society at the, at the time. The Mahachoan goes on to add, Among the few glimpses obtained by Europeans of Tibet and its mystical hierarchy of perfect lamas, there is one which was correctly understood and described. The incarnations of the Bodhisattva Padmapani or Avalokiteshvara, and of Sunkapa, that of Amitabha, relinquish at their death the attainment of Buddhahood, i.e. the summum bonum of bliss and of individual personal felicity, that they might be born again and again for the benefit of mankind. That was written by someone called Rhys Davids. In other words, that they might be again and again subjected to misery, imprisonment in flesh, and all the sorrows of life provided that by such a self-sacrifice, repeated throughout long and, w and dreary centuries, they might become the means of securing salvation and bliss in the hereafter for a handful of men, chosen among but one of the many races of mankind. And his we, the humble disciples of these perfect lamas, who are expected to allow the Theosophical Society to drop its noble title that of the Brotherhood of Humanity, to become a simple school of psychology? No, no, good brothers, you have been labouring under the mistake too long already. Let us understand and each other. He who does not feel competent enough to grasp the noble idea sufficiently, to work for it, need not undertake a task too heavy for him. For there is hardly a theosophist in the whole society unable to effect effectually help it by correcting the erroneous impressions of the outsiders, if not by actually propagating himself the idea. Oh, for the noble, for no, the noble and unselfish men to help us effectually in India in that divine task. All our knowledge, past and present, would not be sufficient to repay him. So, as stated earlier, Amitabha is the Jnani Buddha who struck the keynote of the fourth round. At the end of the fourth race, he reincarnates as a, as a Bodhisattva, Avalokiteshvara, who then incarnates as a human Buddha, Gautama Buddha, being the one in question. Sonkapa was the re reformer and the founder of the Yellow Cap or Galugpa sect of Buddhism in Tibet, as opposed to the Red Caps, who were becoming more and more degenerate in their practices. He was also said to have been a reincarnation of the Buddha. The Theosophical Glossary states, talking about the Panchen or Tashi Lama, he was the great ocean or teacher of wisdom. The title of the Teshu Lama at Chingsde, Chingadse, an incarnation of Amitabha, 
the celestial father of Chenresi, which means to say that he is an avatar of Sonkapa. De jure, the Tashu Lama is second after the Dalai Lama. De facto, he is higher, since it is Dharma Richin, the successor of Sonkapa, at the Golden Monastery founded by the latter reformer and established by the Glugpa, yellow cap sects, who created the Dalai Lamas at Lhasa, and who was the first of the dynasty of the Panchen Rinpoche. While the former Dalai Lama are addressed as Jewel of Majesty, the latter enjoy a far higher title, namely Jewel of Wisdom, as they are High Initiates. So it seems, you know, the Chinese are supposed to have um, kidnapped the Panchen Lama and uh, replaced him with their own, but they don't realise that the Panchen Lamas are High Initiates, much higher than the Dalai Lama, <coughs> esoterically. So it now becomes clear that the masters who founded the Theosophical Society were part of this hierarchy with Gautama Buddha at the head. This is why there was so much emphasis on the Buddha in the letter. The Mahachuan concludes by saying, To be true, religion and philosophy must offer the solution of every problem. That the world is in such a bad condition morally is a conclusive evidence that none of its religions and philosophies those of the civilised races, less than any other, have ever possessed the truth. The right and logical explanations on the subject of the problems of the great dual principles, right and wrong, good and evil, liberty and despotism, pain and pleasure, egotism and altruism, are as impossible to them now as they were 1881 years ago, or even 2021 years ago as far from the solution as they ever were, but to these there must be somewhere a consistent solution, and if our doctrines will show their competence to offer it, then the world will be the first, first one to confess that must be the true philosophy, the true religion, the true light, which gives truth and nothing but the truth. And HPB adds at the end of her Lucifer article, and this truth is not Buddhism, but esoteric Buddhism. And the, the difference is that Buddhism that she says, esoteric Buddhism, has one D, not two, which means wisdomism. And now it's a different than the, the religion of, of, of Buddha. He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. <clears throat> so Buddhism is a man-made religion, no matter how spiritual it is. Earlier, the Mahachuan had said that even exoteric Buddhism was a surest path towards the one esoteric truth. But HPB also said that the title of AP Sinnott's book, Esoteric Buddhism, should have been spelt with the one D and not the two, as there is a vast difference between this man-made religion of Buddhism and Buddhism, which roughly means, I've said, wisdomism, as Buddha is derived from the Sanskrit word Buddha, which means to know true spiritual knowledge. So it has a much wider implication and in fact is identical with the word theosophy. So the letter was a very clear message to human synod and to all of us that the Theosophical Society was founded by a hierarchy that had the Buddha as its head. As it, as he, as he was just one in a series of Buddhas and Bodhisattvas that appear cyclically and are concerned with the welfare of the world. They watch over this planet and at certain times, when they feel it is needed, they send someone into the world to try to help us to become aware of our divinity. It is said that Tsongkhapa initiated that the last 25 years of each century there will be a spiritual impulse which might take the form of a person, a group of people, or just a spiritual outpouring in general. At the end of the 19th century, it may have been thought that the Victorian mind would respond more to an actual person in the form of H. P. Blavatsky, whereas at the end of the 20th century, when people in general were wary of anyone calling themselves a guru, it might have been thought better to initiate a general spiritual impulse for those who have ears to hear. It is notable that from around 1875 onwards, there was a rise in the number of spiritual movements worldwide, and the New Age movement 
also st started about that time in earnest. But of course there were and are also a number of false prophets as there always has been uh, and will be. Lessons we could all learn from this, especially as theosophical students and members, is that whatever we do, the motivation of brotherhood should be at the centre of it all. And we should have this within sight constantly. Also the practice of brotherhood amongst ourselves, as we are supposedly forming a nucleus of that brotherhood, and therefore showing forth to the world what such a brotherhood is like. That is the main aim of the Theosophical Society, not just to learn about reincarnation, karma, rounds and races, etc., well, that is essential too, of course, so that we can share with others. But without this motivation of brotherhood, it means nothing in the context of the Theosophical Society that we have joined. What we all need to get straight is our, is our motivation. Are we learning just for our own selfish satisfaction? Are we on the way to becoming Pratyeka Buddhas, to enter Nirvana with no thought for others, and therefore risk being reincarnated in the next round as lesser beings? To struggle our, our way upwards again? HPB has said earlier, regarding the Ma Chowan's letter, as a charter for the Theosophical Society. It certainly gives clear directions as to the purpose of the Society. As Master K.H. wrote in the Mahatma letters, and I quoted earlier, the chiefs want a brotherhood of humanity, a real universal fraternity started. So we have to become careful that we do not become an academy of magic and the whole of occultism has said, but that we spend our time and energy cultivating brotherhood and tolerance for others and compassion and love. These are the traits we should be developing first and foremost. The voice of the silence says that even ignorance is better than head learning with no soul wisdom to illuminate and guide it. We should cultivate this soul wisdom preeminently. An eminent Buddhist scholar at the time, Eugene Bournoff, Commenting on this letter says, Universal charity will appear out of date. The rich will keep their wealth and will go on accumulating more. The poor will become impoverished in proportion until the day when propelled by hunger they'll demand bread, not of theosophy but of revolution. Theosophy will be swept away by the hurricane. We can all recognise some of the elements in society today, but HPB responded to this criticism in Lucifer, Volume 2, pages 429-431, by saying, The Theosophical Society replies, It surely will, were we to follow out his well-meaning advice, yet one which is concerned but with the lower plane. It is not the policy of self-preservation, not the welfare of one or other personality, in its finite and physical form, that will or can ever secure the desired object, and screen, and screen that society, from the effects of the social hurricane to come but only the weakening of the feeling of separateness in the units which compose its chief element and such a weakening can only be achieved by a process of inner enlightenment it is not violence that can ever ensure bread and comfort for all nor is the kingdom of peace and love of mutual help and charity and food for all to be conquered by a cold reasoning diplomatic policy it is only by the close brotherly union of men's and women's selves, of soul solidarity, of the growth and development of that feeling which makes one suffer when one thinks of the suffering of others, that the reign of justice and equality for all can ever be inaugurated. This is the first of the three fundamental objects for which the Theosophical Society was established and called the Universal Brotherhood of Man, without distinction of race sex, colour, caste or creed. Now, many of our political leaders could benefit a lot from taking these words to heart. I hope that one day they will. Until then we as theosophists and theosophical students, aspiring to be theosophists, should at least be trying to live up to them to the best of our ability. The world is more than ever in need of some soul-satisfying teachings that appeal to logic true, true logic, true spiritual logic, rather than emotion or cold intellect. The disaster of a world run by materialistic-minded people or religious fanatics is coming to light all the time. And so if we as theosophical students striving to be theosophists, as said, can truly get rid of our egos and for the sake of humanity strive to truly, li truly live as a nucleus 
of that universal brotherhood, which is, is at the core of our teachings, then I'm sure that the burden of the world will be lightened a little, and we can plant the seeds that will eventually lead to a golden age of light and love. Then we will indeed be carrying out the wishes of the trans Himalayan Brotherhood of Mystics that initiated the Theosophical Movement in general. So thank you for listening. For a moment's silence, a moment's quiet. Thank you. Peace on earth and goodwill to all beings. Om Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. Peace on earth and goodwill to all beings. Thank you for listening and see you soon.